from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of Actifio Data Driven 2020, brought to you by Actifio. We're back. This is the Cube's coverage, our ongoing coverage of Actifio's data driven. Of course, we've gone virtual this year. Ash Ashitosh is here. He's the founder, president, and CEO of Actifio. Ash, great to see you again. Likewise, Dave, always, always good to see you. We have, we were at a little meetup, you and I, in, in Boston. I always enjoy our, our conversations. Little did we know that, you know, a few months later, we'd, we'd only be talking at this type of distance. And, uh, and of course, uh, it's, it's, it's sad. I mean, uh, Data Driven is one of uh, our favorite events. It's intimate, it's customer content driven. The, yeah. the theme this year is, is you, you, you call it the next normal. <laughs> Some people will call it the, the new abnormal, the next normal. What's that all about? I think it's pretty, pretty fascinating to see when we walked in in March, all of us were shocked by the effect of this pandemic. And for a while, we all scrambled around trying to figure out how do you react to this one? And everybody reacted very differently, but most people had this tendency to think that this is going to be a pretty brutal environment with lots of unknown variables. And it is important for us to try to figure out how to get, a, get our hands around this. By the time we came around about six weeks into that, almost all of us have figured out this is, a, this is not something you fight against. This is not something you wait for it to go away, but this is one that you figure out how to live with and you figure out how to work around it. And that we believe is the next normal. It's not about trying to create a new abnormal. It's not about creating a new normal, but it's truly one that basically says there is a, there is a way path path forward, there's a, there's a way to create this next normal and you just figure out how to live with the environment we have. And phenomenal outcomes of companies that have done remarkably well as a result of these actions, uh, active you being one of them. It's quite amazing, isn't it? I mean, I've talked to a lot of tech companies, CEOs and their customers, and it's almost like, they, you know, the first reaction was, of course, they cared about their, their their employees and their broader families. Uh, number one, number two was many companies, as you know, saw a tailwind and in initially didn't want to be seen as ambulance chasing. And then of course the entrepreneurial spirit kicked in and they said, okay, hey, we can only control what we can control. And tech companies in particular have just done exceedingly well. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody really predicted that early on. Yeah, I, I, I think at the heart, we are all, human beings and the first reaction was to take care of you know four constituencies right one take care of your family take care of your community take care of your employees take care of your customers and that was the hardest part the first four to six weeks was to figure out how do you do each of those four once you figured that part out or you figured out ways to get around to making sure you can take care of those you really found the next normal. You really started figuring out how to continue to innovate, how to continue to support each of those four constituencies. And people have done different things. I know it's amazing how uh, Cube continues to operate. As far as the user is concerned, they're all watching remote. Uh, yes, we don't have the wonderful desk and we all get to chat and look in the eye, but the content, the message is as powerful as what it was a few months ago. So. I'm sure uh, this is how we're all going to figure out how to make through this new next normal. Yeah, and, and digital transformation kind of went from, from push to pull. I mean, every conference you'd go to, they'd say, well, look at Uber, you know, look yeah. at Airbnb, and they'd put up the examples, you have to do this too. And then all of a sudden, the industry dragged you along. So I'm curious as to, as to how, and, and, and I guess the other point there is digital means data. We've said that many, many times. If you didn't have a digital strategy, during the, the height of the lockdown, you, you couldn't transact business and still many restaurants are still trying to figure this out. But so how, how did it affect you and your customers? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. And I, we spend a lot of time with um, several of our customers who are managing some of the largest IT organizations. And we talk about a very interesting phenomena that happened somewhere at the beginning of this year. About 20 years ago, we used to worry about this thing called the digital divide, those who have access to the network and internet and those who don't. And now there is this data divide, the divide between organizations that know how to leverage, exploit, and absolutely accelerate the business using data and those who don't. 
And I think we are seeing this effect show very clearly among organizations that are able to come back and address some of this stuff. And it's fascinating. Yes, we all have the examples of the, the likes of uh, uh, people who are doing delivery, people who are doing e-tailing, but there are so many little things. You're seeing organizations, you know, just the other day we had a, a video from Sentry Data, Systems, Sentry, uh, Data Systems, which is helping accelerate COVID-19 research because they're able to get copies of the data faster. They're able to get access to data to their researchers much, much faster, sometimes from you know several days to a few minutes. It's that that level of effect. It's not just down to some subtle, you know, um, you almost think of it as nice to have, but it's must have, life-threatening stuff, essential stuff. Or just addressing, today I was reading a very you know, wonderful article about uh, this uh, supercomputer in, uh, that's doing analysis of COVID-19 and how it's figured out most of these symptoms they're able to figure out by just crunching a ton of data and almost every one of those symptoms that the computer has predicted, the supercomputer has predicted, has been accurate. It's about data, right? It is absolutely about data, which is why I think this is a phenomenal time for companies to absolutely go change, make the transformation about data acceleration, data leverage, data exploitation. And there's a ton of it all, over, all around us. Yeah, and, and part of that digital transformation, the mandate is to really put data at the core. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen this with the top market cap companies. They've got data at the core. And, and now, as I say, it's, it's become a, a mandate and you know, there's been several things that, that you, we've clearly noticed. I mean, you saw the the work from home required laptops and you know endpoint security and and things of that. VDI had made a yeah. comeback, and, and certainly cloud was there. But I'm I've been struck by the reality of multi cloud. I was kind of a multi cloud skeptic early on. Yeah, I, I said many times I thought it was more of a symptom than it was a strategy. But it's that's completely flipped. Uh, recently in our ETR surveys we saw multi-cloud popping up all over the place. I wonder what you're seeing when you talk to your customers and, and other CIOs. Yeah, so fascinating. You know, we released our first cloud product sometime around 2018, end of 2018. Go, right, yeah. Yeah, Actifio Go, um, Onboard, which is a phenomenal way to completely change the way you think about the using object storage in the cloud. For about two years, uh, we saw about 20% of our business, by the end of two years, the beginning of this year, 20% of our business was uh, built on leveraging the cloud. Since March, so that was the end of our, almost the end of the Q1, so now we're just in the middle of Q3. In six months, we added 12 more percent of the business. Literally, we did it in six months what we did not do before for 18 months before that, right? Well, significantly more than what we did for a year and a half before that. Mm -hmm. And there are really three reasons. And we see this over and over again. We have a large customer we closed in January. Ironically, we were deploying out of UK, a very large marketing organization, got everything deployed. They were running their, their uh, backup and DR in a separate data center. And they had a practical problem of not being able to access the second site. Literally in the middle of deployment, we steered that customer to GCP or Google Cloud because there was simply no way for them to continue protecting the data, being able to develop new applications with that data. They simply had no access. So there was, this was the number one reason, the, the inability for an organization to physically access or put their, their, their employees at risk and have, quote unquote, the cloud be the infrastructure. That's number one. So that, first of all, drove the reason for the cloud. And then there's a second reason. There are practical reasons on why some cloud platforms are good at one workload, the other ones are not so good at uh, some other workloads. And so if I'm an organization that has, that spans everything, I've got you know, a power PC, an x86 machine, a VM, I've got container platforms, I've got Oracle, I've got SAP. There is no single cloud platform that supports all my workloads as efficiently. It's available in all the regions I want. So inevitably I have to go adopt different cloud platforms. So that's the second practical reason. And then there's a strategic reason. No vendor, no customer wants to be locked into any one cloud platform. At least two, you're going to go pay. More likely three. So those are the reasons. And then interestingly enough, we were on a panel with uh, uh, global CIOs 
And in addition to just the usual cloud providers that we all know and love inside the US, across the world, in Europe, in Asia, there's a rise of the regional cloud providers. See, so you, you take all these factors, right? You got absolute physical necessity, you got practical constraints of what can the cloud provider support, the strategic reasons of why, either because uh, uh, I don't want to be locked into a cloud provider or because there is a, there's a rise of you know, data nationalism that's going on, where people want to keep their data within the country bounds. All of these reasons are the foundation for why multi-cloud is almost becoming a de facto. It's impossible for a decent sized organization to assume they will just depend on one cloud anymore. The other big trend we're seeing, and I wonder if you could comment, is this, this notion of the data life cycle, or the data yeah. pipeline. Uh, it's a very complex situation for a lot of organizations. Their data is siloed, we hear that a lot. They have data scientists, data engineers, uh, developers, data quality engineers, just a lot of different constituencies and lines of yeah. business and it's kind of a mess. And so what yeah. they're trying to do is bring that together. So they've, they've done that. Data scientists complain, they spend all their time wrangling data. Uh, but, but ultimately the ones that are succeeding to putting data at the core, as we've just been discussing, are, are seeing amazing outcomes. Absolutely. By being able to have a single version of the truth, have confidence in that data, create self-serve for their, for their lines of business and actually reduce the end-to-end -end cycle times. It's driving you know, major monetization, whether that's cost cutting or, or revenue. And I'm curious as to what you're seeing. You guys do a lot of work, heavy work in DevOps and hardcore database. Those are key components of that data life cycle. Uh, yeah. What are you seeing in that regard, uh, regarding yeah. that data pipeline? Yeah, that's, a, that's a phenomenal point. If you really want to go back and exploit data within an organization, if you really want to be a data-driven organization, the very first thing you have to do is break down the silos. Ironically, every organization has all the data required to make the decisions they want to, they just can't either get to it, or it's so hard to break the silos that it's just not worth trying to make it happen. And 10 years ago, we set out on this mission. Now, rather than keep these individual silos of data, why don't we flip it open and make it into a pipeline, which looks like a data cloud, where essentially anybody who's consuming it has access to it based on the governance rules, based on the security uh, rules that the operations people have set, and based on the kind of format they want to see data. Not everybody may want to see the data uh, in a database format. Maybe you want the database format converted to a CSV format before you run analytics. And this idea of making data the new infrastructure, this idea of having the operations people provide this new layer called data, it's finally come to roost. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I was looking at the numbers last quarter. Uh, we just finished our Q2. Uh, now, 45% of our customer base uses Actifio for, or reuses the backup data for things that accelerate the business, things that make the business move faster, more productive, or even survive. That was the mission. That was what we set out to do 10 years ago. You know, we were talking to an analyst this morning, and now there's this question of, you know, hey, it looks like there's a theme of backup data being reused. We said, yeah, that's kind of what we've been saying for 10 years. Backup cannot be an insurance. Backup cannot be a destination. It has to be something that you can use as an asset. And that, I think, is finally coming to the point where you can use backup as a single source of truth only if you designed it right from the beginning for that purpose. You cannot just, there are lots of, lots of ways to fake it, make it, try to pretend like you're doing it. But that was the true purpose of you know, making data, the new infrastructure, making it a cloud, making it something that is truly an asset. And uh, it's fascinating to see our businesses. You, know, it's, you take any of our large accounts and uh, the way they've gone about transforming not just basic backup and DR, yes, we are the world's fastest backup and most scalable DR solution. That's, that's the starting point. But to be able to use that to develop applications eight, 10 times faster, to run analytics 100x faster, the more data you have, the more people who, who use data you have, the better this return becomes. You know, that is interesting to hear you talk about that because that has been the holy grail of, of, of backup was to go beyond insurance to actually create business value. 
And you're actually seeing some underlying trends. We talked about that data pipeline, and one of the areas that is the most interesting is in database, which was so yeah. boring for so many years. Uh, and you're seeing new workloads emerge. They take the data warehouse beyond you know, reporting, never really lived up to its, uh, its promise of 360 degree view. You mentioned analytics. That's yeah. really starting to happen. Uh, yeah. and, and it's all about data. You know, John Furrier used to say that you know, data yeah. is, the, is the new development kit. Uh, you call it the new infrastructure, and it's sort of the yeah. same, same type of theme. So maybe some of the trends you're seeing in, uh, in, in database, I'd love to, to talk about that for a little bit, and then pick your brains on some other tech, like object storage is another one that we've yeah. really seen take yeah. off. Yeah, so I think our, our journey with object storage began in 2016, 2017, as we started to adopt cloud platform in response to the user requirements. Um, we did what like most companies have done and unfortunately continue to do. We take the on-prem product and then just move it onto the cloud. And one of the things we saw was there was a fundamental difference of how the design points of a, of a cloud uh, engineering is all about. Now, what what they design it for? Object storage is one of those one of those primitives, the fundamental uh, storage primitives that the cloud providers actually produced. That we nobody really exploited it. There was it was used as a you know graveyard for data. It's a replacement for mm -hmm. data, place where data goes to die. And then we look at it very closely and say, well, this is actually a massively scalable, very low cost storage, but it has some problems. Now it has an interface that you cannot use with uh, traditional servers. Uh, it has uh, some issues around you know, not being able to read, modify, write the data, so it feels like you're consuming a lot of storage. So we went out to solve those problems. It took us a good two years to come back with something called OnVault that fundamentally treats object storage like this massively scalable, high-performance disk. disk, except it's ridiculously low cost and optimize the capacity. So this thing called OnVault that we patented has really become the foundation of how everything in the cloud works without using CPU. Today, there is simply nothing at a lower TCO that actually if you want to do basic backup, DR, more importantly, use that to do this massive analytics. Now you're talking about data warehouse, data lakes. I guess now there's something called data lake house. Uh, yeah. all, of these are, all of these are still silos. All of these are people trying to take some data from somewhere, put it into another new construct and have it be controlled by somebody else. This is out of sync. It's just, you just move the silos from some place to another place instead of creating a pipeline. And if you want to really create a pipeline, object storage has to be an integral part of that pipeline, not a separate bucket by itself. And that's what we did. And same thing with databases. You know, most business, most of the critical business runs on databases. And the ability to, to find a way to leverage those and move them around, leverage in terms of whichever format a database is accessed, whichever location it's accessed, doesn't matter how big it is, uh, lots of work has gone into trying to figure, figure that one out. And we, we had some very, uh, very good partners and some of our largest customers who helped take the journey with us. Um, pretty much you know, all of the global 2000 accounts you see across the board were an integral part of our process. Yeah, you mentioned the word journey. And, and it triggered a yeah. thought is uh, your, your discussion with Ravi, the CIO of, of Seagate, yeah. who's a customer yeah. of yours. Uh, and what he said, I, I liked what he said. He, of course, he used the term journey, we all do. But he said, you know what? I kind of don't like that term because I, I want to inject a sense of urgency, essentially what he was saying. I want speed. You know, the journey is like, okay, kids, get in the car. We're going to drive across country. We're going to yeah. make some stops. And so while there's a journey, he also was was really trying to push the organization hard, and he talked about yeah. culture uh, as some of the the most difficult things. And he, of course, like many CIOs said, oh, the technology is almost the easy part. It's true when it works. <laughs> you know? That's true. That's true. But I thought that was a great discussion that you had. What were your some some of your takeaways? With I think you know, Ravi is a very astute uh, IT executive who's been around the block for so long, and one of the fascinating things. Uh, when I, I asked him this question about, hey, what's the biggest challenge? Because he's gone through this a couple of times. What is the biggest challenge? Taking an organization as venerable, as well-known as Seagate is, I mean, this is a, this is a data company. This is, this is at the heart of all of our, half the world's data is on Seagate stuff. 
how do you take this old company that's been around for long in the middle of Silicon Valley and make it into a into a fast growing transformation uh, company that's responding to you know, newer challenges. And I thought he was going to come back with, well, you know, I got to go through three pieces. I picked this technology, that technology. And surely that's exactly where I expected he would uh, end up with. It was, it was nothing to do with technology. I mean, in this day and age, when you can have, when Elon Musk can send a car to Mars, there's not many technologies that we can't really solve. Maybe COVID-19 is the next frontier we got to go solve. But frankly, he hit upon the one thing that matters to every company. It is the fundamental culture to create a bias to action. It's a fundamental culture where you have to come back and have a deliverable that moves the ball forward every day, every month, every quarter, as opposed to have this series of, like you said, a journey that says, and we all know this, right? People talk about, Oh, we're going to do this in phase one. We're going to do this in phase two. And we're going to do this in phase three. Nothing ever happens in phase three. Nobody gets around to phase three. So I think he did a great job of saying, I fundamentally had to go change the culture. That was my biggest takeaway. And this, I've heard this so many times. The most effective IT execs who have made the transformation, it actually shows in the people that they have. It's not the technology, it's the people. And some, it's, this history is replete with organizations that have done remarkably well, not by leveraging the heck out of the technology, but truly by leveraging the change in the people's mindset. And of course, that, that mindset leverages technology where appropriate. But you know, Ravi is an insightful person, always such a delight to talk to him, such a delight for him to you know, have chosen us as a, as a foundational technology for him to go pull his data warehouses and completely transform how he's doing manufacturing across the globe. Yeah, I want to add some color to what you just said because <clears throat> some, a key, some key takeaways that, that from what you just said, Ash, is, is, you know, you're right. When you look back at the history of the computer industry, it used to be very well-known processes, but the technology was the big mystery and the, yeah. and the big risk. And you yeah. think about with, with COVID, were it not for technology, we we didn't know what was com coming. We, we were inventing new processes literally every day, every week, every month. And so technology was pretty well understood and, and, and enabled that. And when yeah. you when you think when we talked earlier about putting data at the core, it was interesting to hear Ravi. He, he basically said, yeah, we had a big data team in the US, a big data team in Europe. We, we actually organized around silos. And, and so yeah. you guys played a role. You were very respectful about, you know, touting Actifio with him, you did ask him, you know, what, what role you play, but it was interesting to hear him talk about how he had to address that both culturally and of course there's technology underneath to enable that unification of, of data, that silo busting, if you will. And you yeah. guys played a role in that. Yeah, you know, I, I always enjoy um, conversation with uh, folks who have taken a problem, identified what needs to be done, and then just get it done. And it's that's more fascinating than yeah, of course, Actifio plays a small part in a lot of things, and we're proud to have played a small part in his big initiative. And that's true of you know the thousands of customers we talk about. But it, it's such a fascinating story to have leaders who come back and make this transformation happen, and to understand how they went about making those decisions, how they identified where the problem was. These are so hard. I mean, we all see them in our own lives, right? We see there is a there is a problem, but sometimes it takes a while to try to understand. You know, how do you identify them, and what do you have to do, and more importantly, actually do it. And so, whenever you, whenever I get an opportunity with with people like Ravi, I think understanding that, and if there's a way to help, uh, we always make sure that we play our own small part, and we're privileged to be a part of those kinds of journeys. Well, I think what's interesting about Actifio and the, the company that you created is, is essentially that we're talking about the democratization of data, that whole data pipeline that discussion that we had, the, the self-service of, of that data to the lines of business. And you know, you guys clearly play a role there. The multi-cloud discussion fits into that. I mean, that these are all trends that are tailwinds for companies that can that can help sort of you know flatten the data uh, globe, if you if you will. Uh, your final thoughts, Ash? Yeah. I, you said something that is so much at the heart of every IT exec that we are talking to. 
if data truly is the fundamental asset that I finally end up with as an organization, then democratization of data, where I do not lock this into another silo, another platform, another cloud, another application, has to be part of my foundation design. And therefore, my ability to use each of these cloud platforms for the services they provide, while I am able to move the data to where I need it to be, that is so critical. So you almost start to think about the one possession an organization now has, and we talked about this uh, with a group of CIOs. They might be some pretty soon, not too far off, but if data is truly an asset, I might actually have a data mart, a data market, just like you have a stock market where I can start to sell my data. You know, imagine at COVID-19, there's so many organizations that have so much data and many of them have contributed to this research because this is an existential issue, but you can see this turning into a next level. So yes, we've got Active has helped move the data to a one level higher where it's become a foundational construct for an organization. The next part is, can I actually turn this into an asset where I actually monetize some of this stuff? And it will be not too long when you and I will be talking about how there's this new exchange and what's the rate of data for from this company versus that company, and there'll be future trading options. Who knows? It's going to be very interesting. Well, I think you're right on. This notion of a data marketplace is, is coming, and it's not not that far away. Well, Ash, it's always great to, to talk to you. I hope next year at Data Driven we can we could be face to face. But I mean, look, this has been we we've dealt with it. It's it's actually created opportunities for us to kind of reinvent ourselves. So congratulations on the success that you've had, and uh, and thank you for coming on the cube. No, thank you for hosting us. And uh, I'm always a big fan of uh, Cube. You guys, we've uh, engaged with you since early days and it is fascinating to see how this company has grown. And it's probably many people don't even know how much you've grown behind the scenes mm -hmm. and all the technologies and culture that you created yourself. So it's uh, hopefully you know, one day we'll switch the table and I'll be on the other side and ask you about transformation, digital transformation of Cube itself. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. Uh, and thanks again, and thank you everybody for, for watching our continuous coverage of Actifio Data Driven. Keep it right there. We'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. Thank you, Dave.